Our first speaker is uh, Paul Richmond, and Paul will talk about his experience on uh, developing the Flame GPU software for agent-based simulations on GPUs. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, welcome to the GPU session, and I'm going to start the first talk by uh, describing a piece of software that does its very best to hide the fact that GPUs are actually involved at all. Um, so, Flame GPU, what is it? What's it for? So, it's a complex systems simulator. So, it's a, a piece of software for simulating complex systems. And complex systems are kind of everywhere. There are all kinds of different biological scales, social scales. And the example I always like to use is, is, is a flock of birds. You get these beautiful, and this is not the nicest example of a flock of birds, but it's, it's the best one I could get that was license free. So, you can use your imagination and picture, you know, a, a murmuration of starlings. But the, the, the reason I like to use that example is because you can create a model of it using really simple rules. You know, you can give birds, you know, some very, you know, simple individual behaviours some with, with some perception. They have simple rules, avoid each other, uh, match velocities. And then when you simulate them together, when they communicate as part of a, a system, you get kind of these, these beautiful emergent phenomena. And that's really what Flame GPU is, right? It's a simulator to allow you to express those individual behaviours and then observe the emergent effects of a model. Um, as I said, the, the main aim, the main thing that we want to do with Flame GPU is in fact hide the GPU completely, as, as, much, as, as much as possible. Um, so the reason being, well, there's, 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 there's many reasons really, but um, the main being the, the idea of kind of promoting the separation of concerns. So separation of concerns being that you want modelers to write models, you don't want them to write advanced GPU code because it means maintaining a model uh, becomes highly complicated if it's intrinsically linked to its implementation and that implementation becomes complicated because of you know, the, 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 the way you've implemented it to become parallel. So what we do is with Flame is we try and kind of separate that. So we, we say Flame's are simulating behind the scenes, we'll do the, the complexities of optimization and data structure building and the parallelization and we'll present to you an interface that allows you to describe a model. And I think it's a really powerful abstraction. You know, it works for, if you think about other domains where it works, it works for deep learning. You go and use uh, TensorFlow and things like that. You don't necessarily even need to know you're using a GPU, you just, just describe your model and it's mapped to the GPU and it's automatically parallelized. So Flame's a piece of software then that I've worked on for a very long time. So I, I did this as part of my PhD and somehow I'm still kind of developing it and maintaining it. Fortunately, you know, when I started it was just me and now there's a, a reasonable team of people. Hi Pete, hi Rob. And Matt's in here somewhere as well. So thank you very much to everyone that's kind of contributed over the last, it's like nearly 10 years of development on it. Um, so it, as I said, it's, it started my PhD, it's had a succession of bits of grant funding, uh, and now it's involved in various bits of kind of reasonably high profile work where it's being applied and, and we're seeing kind of the benefits of, of using it at scale within specific research projects. So what, what, why, what, like, why flame? Like why, I've, I've, I've said the, uh, the, the motivation is to hide the GPUs, but you know, it's, it's, what's the kind of the challenge in doing so really is that it's, you know, there's, there's various things that make what, what flame does difficult to do. Right, so the, the main one being that, you know, accelerating something on a GPU, a GPU code, it's quite difficult in the first place, right? Writing GPU code is not the easiest kind of code to write. Um, doing so for an agent-based model is, is quite difficult because there are all kinds of horrible things agent-based systems do, uh, but people do it, right? They go and write an agent-based model on the GPU. Uh, it doesn't have the separation of concerns, but, you know, they, they go and do it anyway. But to do so for a general case is really, really difficult because there's all these things that the that, that, that agents do. So there's the, the fundamental principle is, you know, you, you don't have a unified parallel model for an agent. Look at lots of different agent-based simulators. They've all got different abstractions. They've all got different ways things work. And a lot of them stem from this idea of like a chessboard design where you have these things that serially move uh, across a chessboard, and that is just, that's just a terrible thing to try and parallelize on the GPU. We've done it, and, and we've, we've used different abstractions as well, but it's a difficult starting point. You know, agents are he heterogeneous as well, so you know, the more complex a model becomes, the more kind of diversity there is in behavior within a model. Again, that's not great for GPUs, because you're gonna have code divergence, which is gonna affect performance. Agents communicate. So, you know, they're, they're constantly communicating and they do so using complex patterns. It might be over spatial distance, it might be over a network, it could be with everything in, in the entire kind of virtual world that you're simulating. But 
either way, there's, there's complex data structures that are required to accelerate that on a GPU system. They don't stay still, they move around, so all those data structures you've built need to be constantly rebuilt. You know, it's not, it's not a static problem that you go away and solve. And then the other thing that is, is GPUs keep getting bigger. So since I started with Flame GPU, there's, I think it's something like a, a 20 times increase in the level of parallelism that a GPU has. So to keep a GPU busy, it needs, you know, it needs a lot of threads of execution and the, the, you know, Flame needs to find a way to continue to utilize that to get good performance. And I've got a separate talk that's all about that, if, if that's something that you particularly care about. And Flame provides then a, a modern abstraction to resolve these issues. So the way that it does that, the, the, the kind of the most important thing is the abstraction that we use for describing an agent. So we use um, a state-based representation. So state-based representation is incredibly important because it allows us to group things that are doing similar things together. Yeah, so you group agents by state. So say you've got a biological cell system, you say, oh, these are, the, these are the, the, the cells that are migrating, these are the cells that are dividing. Um, and because they're in similar states, they're more likely to perform similar functions, which means that you can build these kind of state graphs of behavior. Uh, it means that we can, um, uh, based off the kind of the state-based representation, we use uh, messages so that agents communicate indirectly, so they never communicate directly with one another. Again, that's quite a powerful thing because it allows us to build like a, a, a DAG, a, di a directed acyclic uh, graph. Um, and it means that it doesn't matter the order in which behaviors kind of execute because as long as you know, anything that has output a message has happened before any function that's going to input a message, um, you have some kind of guarantee of synchronization, which makes the parallelization a lot easier. Um, and it means that we can do things like dependency analysis. So here's a really simple example. So I said about a kind of a, a, a flock of birds at the beginning. We have a benchmark model called Circles, which was what, what's just run down in the, uh, the bottom left corner. It's, effectively, it's the same model. So you've got a single state and things transition and perform different functions. So the first function that an agent would perform is send locations, really simple function. They send some message that, that other agents can read at some point in the future. Next behavior is read locations. So agents will gather those messages, extract variables or information from them that is relevant to their, their kind of future behavior. So you might wanna know the location of, of neighboring birds so that you can uh, adjust your velocity. And then they perform a function called move. Uh, and that's really the, the simplest example of a, of a kind of a state-based model that you could have. Um, you can have more complicated examples than that. Um, they can look something like this. So obviously this is where, you know, the, the, the separation of concerns is really important because, you know, implementing a flock of birds, you know, that's not too bad. There's, I could implement that on the GPU. But once you get to the point that you have this kind of complexity of behavior, it's just not it's not something that's going to be very easy to, to either write or maintain. And there's a lot of duplicated behavior in there in terms of building data structures and things as well. So, um, so how, how do we go and do it then? So Flame GPUs, there's kind of two main components to it. There's the describe your model and then describe your behavior. Describing your model is quite easy because we have an API. We just have an API where you say, this is an agent. This is the variables that it has and the variables are things like, uh, you know, like a variable X, Y, Z. So if it has, a, it has a location, it would have an X, Y, Z. It has a particular type. In this case, we're using float. Um, and we can build up a description of our model in this way. We describe agents, we describe messages, we describe the relationships between them, and we describe functions, but not the behavior. So we describe when a function would take place. Um, but what we would then do is the more, much more difficult part is describe the behavior, right? So this, is a, a more complicated version of, a, of, of an agent function. This is what a user would see when they write a, a, a Flame GPU agent function. Um, so the most important thing is no GPU. So you can't tell that this is actually GPU code or, or in fact that this will execute on, on the GPU. Um, so it's a subset of C++, because obviously not all of C++ is fully supported by uh, its CUDA that we use for kind of uh, parallelizing onto the device. Um, so we've got an agent name. It's kind of the, the, the function syntax is a little bit quirky. That's because there's some kind of templatey magic stuff happening in the background that's so ugly that you would not want you to see it. So you put your kind of your, your agent name in and then a type of messaging for input and a type of messaging for output. So each, each function can either input or output messages. Yeah. 
can't do the same type of the same type of message. So you can't modify a location message and output um, a location message at the same time because that would break the synchronization primitives that we have. But for different messages, you can. So here's some things that happen. Then you always have this flame GPU singleton. What happens is this function will be applied to every single agent in a particular state. It all gets applied to a unique instance. So every time we say something like flame GPU get variable X, it will get the specific X variable of that particular agent. There's some environmental things we can do. So we can get parameters of the model uh, by saying things like this. And then the important part really is this, um, this iterator here. So this range based for loop. So this is abstracting quite a lot. So this is allowing us to traverse a set of messages that we have said will be input. Um, and in this case, the input type is brute force. So the iterator is actually f fairly simple, but there are different iterators that exist. So, and usually a model becomes more complex uh, depending on the type of communication that it would use. And you can have different types of communication within different parts of the model, but you would perhaps have things like spatial uh, communication, which would mean that this iterator behind the scenes is accessing a, a spatial data structure that's been built to return only messages within a certain fixed radius. Yeah. But that's nicely abstracted uh, and it means that you can gather information. In this case, we're gathering the, the locations of nearby agents and then we're updating our state at the end. So in terms of the library, um, you know, it's, it's the, the way in which you use it then is you describe your model, you do it in C++. Um, uh, it links with the Flame GPU library. Um, you can specify separately input and output um, kind of states. So the, the initial kind of X and Y values of all of your agents can either come from kind of a, a, an input file, or you can s specify those procedurally as part of the model if, if, if you're so inclined. And it will generate then either uh, just a, a, a non-visual simulator that will run for a number of iterations, or, if you're so inclined, you can generate an interactive visualization. There are default ways to visualize agents, or you can extend that and display it as, as kind of slightly nicer visualizations, which you'll see in a moment. Um, this, this side of the things is, is where it gets kind of slightly interesting then. So uh, in addition to kind of wanting to hide the fact that we're on the GPU, what we want to do is make the, the, the simulator kind of more accessible. One of the ways that we've, we've done that is by targeting Python. Um, and there's, there's two components to that. One is, you know, wrapping the API, which is relatively simple with something like Swig. I, sorry, I, I'm downplaying how complicated it is. It's not that simple, but it's simpler than the other part, which is wrapping the GPU code so that it will execute kind of within a Python. Um, yeah, so it can execute by Python. So there's, 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 and the reason why that is difficult is obviously Python's not pre-compiled. So in the C++ version, you compile your code and you can run it with Python. You specify an agent function, uh, but it needs to be compiled at runtime. So what we do is we go through a process of just-in-time compilation, uh, which is actually, um, you know, and our initial attempt to do this is that you specify using the Python API your model, and then you pass in like a stringified version of the C++ agent function that you'd seen. I know that's horrible, right? Yeah, but bear with me, we're, we're going to do better than that. So you'd pass that in and it would be just in time com com compiled. And that was tricky enough to, to figure out the infrastructure of doing that, but that, that, that works, that's lovely. We use a, a tool called Jitify from NVIDIA to help kind of simplify some of that as well. Um, in doing so, it's meant that we could add some clever optimization stuff. So all throughout Flame, you see kind of things like this, getting a named variable uh, that's like a string variable with a particular type. So at compile time, we have a clever way of doing this, which uses kind of compile time string hashing to turn that into effectively a number with a simple kind of runtime hash table that will translate it to a piece of GPU memory. Just in time is much better because we can pre-do that. We can just use lookup tables, so we can take the the variable and we can kind of we know what variable is going to be accessed because we've specified that in our model and we can we can optimize effectively. So it means that the Python code is actually faster than our C++, which is quite rare for most things, but for for, for Flame GPU it is certainly the case. But no one wants to write a C++ agent function in a Python library, that's just horrible, right? So we've, we've uh, quite, quite recently um, thought very hard about how we could translate something that would be like a Python-based uh, agent function 
into something that would be compiled into GPU code. And there's, there's not a huge number of options for doing so. But in looking at, you know, this is, this is an example of a C++ agent function. This is what we'd like it to look like in Python. In looking at it, it's kind of like, well, it's so close. You know, there's, there's some odd stuff that doesn't quite fit. You know, obviously, we've not got the, 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 the typing, so we have to instantiate particular functions based off type in Python. And the syntax is slightly different. You know, we do away with obviously the, the, the semicolons and, and you know, we, we want to use uh, decorators and things. So, so in fact, what we, what we decided was it's so close that we'd write a transpiler. So we've written uh, something that will take a Python function and it will walk the Python abstract syntax tree and effectively translate it to the equivalent of C++. So this doesn't work. For, for everything. I wouldn't suggest doing this for every form of Python. And there is a, a subset of things that we definitely cannot support because they're not supported in C++ in an obvious way. But it does mean that we have a way we can translate you know, anything that we would normally write in an agent function C++ as a Python equivalent, and we can translate it and then runtime compile it. So what's Flame used for then? Um, well, it's used for a whole range of things. I mentioned uh, at the beginning some, some models that, that we're involved with. Usually it's the case that the most interesting models are the most boring to display. So this is a really boring looking model that's actually really, really complicated. So this is a model of neuroblastoma, part of a big uh, EU project. Uh, so we're wanting to simulate kind of billions of cells potentially with this, with this project. And the way that we go about doing that is by using um, actually simulated patches of a tumor and there's a there's an orchestrator which runs over the top to kind of interpolate both in space and time um, which kind of simplifies the simulation but obviously visually it's it's not that exciting it's much more exciting to look at simpler models actually and this is this is slightly older work but flames used quite a lot for uh, kind of smart city simulation so simulate pedestrians in behaviors so, people moving around, they're not that different to kind of birds in the, the, the behaviors you have, uh, mostly that you want to avoid bumping into people and that you'd like to navigate to particular areas. So there's quite a lot of this type of, of, of thing goes on and then a visualization which unfortunately is really difficult to see, but um, this is lots of cars zipping around. This is part of uh, Peter Hayward's PhD work and some work we did for Department for Transport looking at, at, at vehicle micro simulations. So this is simulating the individual behaviors of, of vehicles within a road network. And more recently, we've been looking at, at COVID modeling. So this is really an extension of the, the, the Olympic Village model that you could see previously, but it's adding a lot more complexity to the behavior. So this is adding um, lots of detail around the track. So this is actually a train and a platform. It doesn't look like a train or platform. I'll show you what it is. Uh, but it's adding lots of detail to the, uh, to the train platform interface so that we can have an understanding about the train design and the dwell time, especially with respect to social distancing and the way in which people did or didn't obey social distancing on, on rail platforms. So at the RSE conference, our, you know, it's only sensible that I list all the good RSE things we've done as part of a, a, a Flame GPU. It's been a real uh, exercise because you know, I'll be the first to admit that you know, when I started writing Flame GPU, I didn't know what an RSE was. And my code looks like some of the code that, that my team now looks at and cringes. Uh, there were no tests or anything like that. So it's, it's been, a, it's been a, a learning process for myself as obviously head of RSE group for my team and for, for everyone around us in terms of putting into practice some of the best practice that we apply kind of more broadly now within the group. So I kind of conclude then, you know, GPUs can be applied to simulate agent-based systems, but doing so for the general case is hard. And that's the thing fundamentally that Flame tries to solve, yeah. Um, so it does so then without losing kind of performance. The, the idea is that we kind of present a, a nice abstraction so that you can write models that are then kind of parallelized automatically. We try and make it as approachable as we can by using tools like Python to make it kind of more accessible. Um, in, in terms of the domain, as I said, it's a general purpose simulator. And, and you can simulate kind of anything with it that can be expressed as an agent-based system. So you've seen cell biology through to kind of pedestrian uh, systems. Um, in terms of a development exercise, it's been kind of, yeah, it's been, it's been a, a kind of a really exciting journey, both in terms of kind of writing research software, but also the process that we've been through, kind of me personally, and then as a team in terms of finding funding to support and continue to develop 
uh, piece of software that you're passionate about. And I'm sure kind of most people in, in, in the audience have similar experience of developing research code that they'd like to kind of progress. So if, if that's something you're interested about, kind of come and talk to me later. I can probably say a bit more about that. Um, so I'll leave it there, I think, and just say, yeah, it's, it's, it's available for free because we've got a Python thing. You can click a button on our website and have a play on the, uh, on the, the Google Colab version of our tutorial. Can't do the visualization on Colab, you'll have to download it to do that, but uh, that's something that we're working on for the future. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, I shall go over to the questions. We have one at the moment, uh, but if you have some, feel free to get on Slido and, and type something in. So the first question, the model is reminiscent of models of interacting particles. Can you comment on the similarities, differences versus other fields using GPUs, e.g. molecular dynamics? Yeah, so uh, absolutely it is. You know, it's, it's, a part, it, it, it's effectively the same as a particle simulator. Yeah, so the, 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 the kind of the abstraction of an agent-based model is, it, it does, it covers a huge range of different domains that have got different words for it, and there's a lot of shared experience, particularly on the, the technical implementation of things like the data structure side, so things like smooth particle hydrodynamics doing basically exactly the same algorithm for spatial partitioning as we are. Uh, same with molecular dynamics, there's, there's lots of similar kind of approaches for kind of scanning and sorting that we use kind of behind the scenes. So yeah, so they're, they're, they're very, very similar, yeah. The difference I think is that uh, the agent-based modeling is kind of, it's more general, right? Because it's not talking about a specific communication type and it's not talking about a specific domain. So you can have much broader behavior uh, and, and interactions. So, have we thought about sporting other backends beside CUDA? No, no. No, of course, of course we have. Um, I mean, when I started doing this, CUDA didn't exist, right? So when I first started writing an agent-based model for the GPU, I did it using graphics primitives and shaders because CUDA didn't exist. So obviously when it did, it was, it was an exciting time to be able to get away from that horrible, horrible uh, kind of uh, programming exercise. Um, and, and CUDA, because it was the first and because it's well spotted, it's, it's something that's kind of stuck. There are reasons why we haven't kind of migrated to other um, kind of runtime systems as, as kind of more recently, and that's because of some of the advanced functionality we've wanted in uh, around the kind of the runtime compilation. So I believe that there are now uh, the right primitives existing within HIP that would mean that we could um, put a, a kind of an AMD backend or backend for other bits of hardware as well. Um, and yeah, we've got funding under submission that may perhaps allow us to do that quite soon. But as with all funding, we will wait and see. Yeah. Um, so do we spot non-NVIDIA GPUs? So it's the same question, like, no, it's CUDA at the moment. Um, so it, it runs on NVIDIA GPUs, but as I said, a different backend would allow us to, uh, to, to, to run on non-NVIDIA GPUs and CPUs as well. And it's something that is planned, but it's quite a big development exercise. So it's, it's not something we'll do as part of the maintenance. It will have to be funded as part of a software grant rather than you know, an additional feature that would be tagged onto a, a, a more general research project. Uh, what do we expect the future changes GPUs will experience, e.g. unified memory, and how will this affect the Flame API? So it, it shouldn't affect the Flame API is the idea. Because we abstract the GPU away, from a user perspective, it shouldn't affect the API, and that's kind of how we've designed it. So although things like unified memory exist, uh, it would mean that we can utilize them where appropriate, uh, but as, as a Flame user, you would, you would not be able to necessarily tell. And, and indeed, if we write a different back end, you, know, you, you wouldn't, in theory, have to know or care very much that, that we'd done so. We'd just, you'd just swap out probably a line of the model configuration and it would run on a different GPU system. Yeah. Is PyFlame GPU available on Pipconda? Oh. We, 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 so we package it, but it's not available on, on on PIP, it's not available on PIP, and Pete will correct me here, but I be believe there are many reasons why it's not at the moment. One of them is the file size limitations. Um, we're not TensorFlow, so we don't get special permission to, to have kind of huge binary files that we dump on there. Um, Conda would probably be a better option for us, but we're less familiar with how to do that. So 
if you want to work on some open source software and you know about Conda, then come and, come and write us a, <laughs> some Conda stuff. That would be great. Yeah. One more question. Okay. How does the cost of model scale with the number of agents? Does this vary depending on agent behavior interaction? Yes, it varies on, on lots of things, actually. Um, and I've, I, I haven't shown lots of graphs of performance, but I have lots of graphs of performance. Um, it, fundamentally, it, it depends on the model. So the more complex your model, the more memory it will use, the more complex your behavior that will affect the kind of the computational performance of when it executes. Flame GPU does a very you know, it's very well balanced in terms of coping for a range of different models, but fundamentally the performance and the scale of the model that you can support is, is kind of limited to, to, to the model that you have. So our simple benchmarking model, um, we can go really, you can go really, really big. Yeah, we're, we're, it's usually models are constrained by memory uh, rather than performance. So when we get kind of up to kind of 200 million agents or, you know, half a billion agents or something like that, effectively what's happening is, you know, 200, 300,000 of those are running in parallel and then it becomes serial waves of execution on the GPU. Um, yeah, and again, that's something on the development pipeline that we'd like to address in terms of utilizing more GPUs to, to kind of load balance behavior and execution. Okay, so I think that was the last question, so thank you. Yeah. Let's thank Paul again. <laughs>